astronomy and astrophysics, and our briefer will be uh, Marsha Wright. And I'd like the first slide, please. So astronomers have done decadal surveys for a long time, and in fact, we have just started last December our sixth such survey, and we're calling this one Astro 2010, and it is to set the priorities for the next 10 years for astronomy and astrophysics. And our sponsors, of course, are NASA, the National Science Foundation, and for the first time, the Department of Energy. And because we are midstream in this study, I want to emphasize that this presentation really represents my personal views, and one shouldn't construe that what I'm saying may have something to do with the final report. Obviously, I'm participating and, and no, but um, I want to be clear on that point. Let's go to the second chart, please. Astronomers have had a long relationship with human spaceflight. Um, of course, our flagship mission right now, the Hubble Space Telescope, would be nowhere if astronomers, <coughs> if astronauts, had not been willing to risk their lives to fix our telescope. And it's an understatement to say that astronomy is very grateful to that. We also have a, a long-standing tradition of using the, <coughs> the moon when appropriate. Um, astronauts left retro reflectors on the moon's surface, and a very long data set has been gathered um, that have allowed a number of interesting tests of gravitational theories using those data. And so we can see that over um, 40 years, we've had a relationship with the human space program. Let's go to the next slide, please. And there are some plain, some <coughs> regions where there are areas of research where there have been very um, unanticipated connections between what we've learned as a result of, um, for example, the lunar samples that astronauts bat brought back from the moon and how that now is connecting with research that is ongoing. Um, the plot that you see in the lower left corner um, shows the age in mega years of some stars and what's plotted in the vertical direction is how much, essentially how much material is still orbiting those stars. And you can see that there's a very rapid decay over a few hundreds of millions of years of that material. And if we then go and look at the upper plot, that shows the rate of cratering within the solar system and the rapid decline of crater formation is on approximately the same time scale as what we see in, in terms of clearing of dust around other stars. And the stellar time scales come from you know, other astrophysical considerations, and the solar system time scale comes from radioactive age dating of the lunar rocks. And who would have thought that rocks collected in 1970 would have a bearing on research that astronomers are doing with the, with the Spitzer Space Telescope now? So you never know exactly what connection might come out of things, but, it, but it, I find it remarkable that these two different timescales can now be tied together to reach a conclusion about how planetary systems may be in their initial stages of formation in this material around the other stars and so on. Let's go to um, the next slide, please. You asked two questions um, that you wanted scientists to answer. And the first was to give examples of important science objectives that the human space flight program could address, um, for example, in the next decade. Now, when NASA chartered Astro 2010, they did not ask us to address the impact of human space flight or how we might take advantage of it directly. But we've received over 400 inputs from the broad astronomical community. We, we asked for white papers on technology development, science, um, missions. And a few of these mention um, a connection with the human space flight program. These were not um, connections you know, that we directly requested. This just came out of what the community is thinking. Um, and a sampling of these ideas are placing new retro reflectors on the moon that would enable more, even more precise measurements, um, deployment of radio telescopes on the back side of the moon, which is a very ambitious program and I think would probably be not in this decade, but several decades hence. 
and the use of newly developed launch vehicles for astronomical missions. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that um, astronomers are nothing if not ambitious, and the bigger the rocket, the bigger the telescope we can think of putting into space. But there were actually um, some other clever ideas for using some of the, the launch vehicles. There was, there's one proposal in our, in our stack of items that I didn't put on the slide, but it's to put um, a laser on Phobos to send back pulses um, so that one gets around having to send the light to there and back as you do with the lunar retro reflector. So there's some, some connections here, um, but I want to, you know, we haven't, we haven't reached a conclusion of which of these ideas we might um, support in the end, which would be the most, what would be the most important to astronomical <laughs> research. But I have to say that um, it would be unfair to say that astronomers are demanding humans in space for their research programs based on what we've received from the community so far. There are places where astronomers will take advantage of the opportunities if there are things there, but there isn't something that's absolutely demanding that a person be there. Um, and of course, there's some engineering connections. Um, what Hubble has taught us is that it's very convenient if astronauts can go visit your telescope. And so with the, the trend to moving toward telescopes that would be in positions like the um, L2 um, point, being able to get there and do something might be a very useful capability. Let's go to the, the next slide. Your second question was um, how science and exploration could be mutually supportive. And of course, this is, this is a question where I think astronomy and human spaceflight share a lot together. Um, astronomy, of course, is essentially the exploration of places that we have no hope of getting to but there are very many connections with that work and where we can go explore. So for example, um, if you go through these many responses that we've gotten from the full community, many now are addressing, looking for other solar systems outside our own. And one might almost characterize this as becoming a big business in astronomy now. There are many, many um, different thrusts in terms of trying to find planets around other stars. And the planet discoveries are accumulating very rapidly. Um, the recently launched Kepler mission will actually, um, we hope, quantify the number of Earth-like planets around other stars. And a new field of transit studies where a planet in orbit around another star actually eclipses it from our point of view. One can learn a lot about that planet from careful study of those data. And another connection between astronomy and human spaceflight comes in the, the realm of studying violent events, both violent events within our own solar system caused by the sun and those caused elsewhere in the galaxy, but which can have an effect on the, on the near Earth and, and inner solar system environments. And so that's a realm where what astronomers want to learn sheds light on human safety factors, and I think um, it's safe to say that a lot of the solar research that has been done on flares is quite relevant to um, human spaceflight. Let's go to the next slide. Just to give you a sense of this discovery of other planets, um, you can see how quickly the number of planets being discovered has gone up since the initial discovery in 1989 to now, and of course 2009, the bar isn't very high because we're not all the way through the, through the year yet. The different colors indicate the different um, strategies for finding the planets. And if you go through the list of planets being discovered, ones as small as Uranus and Neptune sizes are now being found. So we're getting close to the holy grail of finding an, an Earth-sized planet. And as I mentioned before, transit observations are giving us detailed information on the atmosphere characteristics of other, other planets. Let's go to um, number seven, please. So what are the goals for astronomers in this realm? Um, they are to find other planetary systems that look like our own solar system. And the plot in the upper left shows um, a blue band that's the habitable zone and with our own solar system at the top, and then a depiction of a system of um, four planets around another star 
with the unattractive name of Gliese 561, which just happens, Gliese was the man that uh, cataloged the star. It's a cooler star than the sun, so its habitable zone moves in a little bit closer to the star. And you can see from the, the numbers there that planets um, only a few times bigger than the Earth have been found around this star. And in fact, one planet does appear to be within that star's habitable zone. And there, that's an active area of research to find out what the characteristics of that planet might be. Can we see evidence for water and so on? And the picture in the lower left shows the orbits around of planets around another star that mimic what our own inner solar system looks like. And of course, the, the big picture questions are, you know, how do these planetary systems form and evolve? What can that tell us about our own solar system? And conversely, what can studying our solar system tell us about these others? Can we find evidence for life elsewhere? And understanding our own planetary system is essential for um, informing these kinds of astronomical goals. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a very complicated slide, and I won't go through all of the data sets here, but one thing I want to just impress on people is that the plot on the upper left um, shows data taken um, by the Hubble Space Telescope um, studying a planet that transits another star and the pattern of uh, dips and brightnesses in with wavelength for that observation matches um, best with methane and water. And if you look at the plot in the lower left, we <clears throat> there are two spectra from Pluto and Charon in our own solar system, one of which is largely um, covered with water, the other one of which um, this Pluto in the spectrum is dominated by methane. And by comparing what we see from our own solar system to other planets, we're going to learn much more about each of them. The picture on, on the right um, is some more data from the Spitzer Space Telescope, where we're actually, by using this transit technique, able to mat, map out the temperatures on the surface of an, a, another planet and to get a feeling of whether the rotation matters the most or atmospheric circulation and so on. And I find it remarkable that we can learn that much about a planet around another star and we can then begin to compare it with what we learn from the different um, circumstances within our own solar system. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now the other t topic I mentioned where there's considerable mutual interest has to do with what we might call violence in the universe. And of course, the most, um, the closest to home violence it comes from our very own sun. And it's a very active area of research to try to understand exactly what it is that causes the 11 and 22 year solar cycles, what causes the sun's magnetic field to change the way that it does. How does all of that cycle drive in detail, the, the formation of flares. What is it that makes a coronal mass ejection actually happen? Why doesn't that happen from all of the active spots? And it's a key goal for solar physicists to be able to predict what it, why these things happen. And obviously being able to predict rather than just look and see that there's a sunspot group that might cause a problem, being able to actually predict would be much, much more satisfying for safety of humans in space. And there is a lot of hope in the community that the advances in numerical simulations and larger data sets are going to be able to get us um, much closer to this predictability goal. And for looking at long-term time in space, you know, there's a question about whether the solar cycle now is representative or not. And by studying the cycles of other stars, like the sun, we may also be able to shed light on that question. And interestingly enough, um, looking at the solar cycle, or uh, the, the equivalent of the solar cycle on other stars is actually a byproduct of searching for planets because this key technique of looking for repetitive changes in the star's output by transits, um, for those astronomers, the star's intrinsic cycle, like our sun's solar cycle, is kind of a weed and an annoyance, but it, but it means that you've gathered a lot of other relevant data for understanding those kinds of cycles. 
Let's go to number 10. And we already know that there are a lot of galactic cosmic rays that come through our solar system and are clearly um, a hazard to people in space. And that studying those kind of cosmic rays has been a, um, something that astronomers have done for a long time and will continue to be a source, a, a target of study. But we've recently discovered that there's some other um, objects in the universe that are much more dangerous than we might have originally ever thought. Um, we've known for a long time that, that objects emit lots of X-rays and gamma rays. And in <clears throat> late 2004, there was an object called um, a magnetar or a magnetized neutron star, the, a dead end of, of the evolution of a star somewhat more massive than our sun, emitted a flare of gamma rays that was so strong that it actually disrupted our atmosphere down to a depth of about 20 kilometers. Um, the peak strength of this flare was really only registered um, by particle detectors on a mission designed to study the sun largely called RESI. And its p particle detectors could still function and detect these gamma rays at the peak and then other um, satellites unsaturated and came back online. This object was way on the other side of the Milky Way from us and I believe there was an estimate that um, it might have caused as much exposure to someone on, on the space station as a dental um, x-ray. This turned out the space station was on the opposite side of the Earth when this flare went off, so it didn't matter anyway. But if you imagine that you know, we don't have a very complete census of these kinds of objects, um, if there were ones significantly closer, and there's certainly a lot of candidates within the, the Milky Way, um, it could be a, a, an unpleasant experience to have that many gamma rays go through you. They might be easily shielded from, but just another thing to keep in the back of one's mind, that there may be more hazards than we're used to thinking about. Let's go to the next slide. So I want to summarize by saying that astronomers have welcomed past opportunities to take advantage of what human spaceflight offers in terms of opportunities. and we will no doubt take advantage of the opportunities presented in the future. Um, I have to say that there may be some you know, budget issues if, if we want to piggyback something on and we have to pay the entire cost of a human space flight that we will have to discuss what those kinds of budget issues might mean. But the mere fact of humans going into space present opportunities that astronomers will no doubt take advantage of. And if I tried to predict what, what the most significant scientific result from such an enterprise would be right now, I think I would be undoubtedly wrong. That's the lesson from the past, that things you don't predict are, end up being the most interesting. And I think these two topic areas that I highlighted, you know, studying planets around other stars, searching for, for signs of life from those planets, and studying the violent universe are, are region areas where there's a lot of mutual interest between um, astronomical research and human spaceflight. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have time for about one question. Would anyone want to raise one? Chris, you're our expert here, please. Um, so I'll thank you very much for that presentation. I'll try to do this the same sort of thing I did with the last two presentations. What I'm taking away, if, if we think about figures of merit for possible architectures, what I'm taking away from this is twofold. One is architectures that would favor an ability to service uh, astronomical observatories, including astronomical observatories in, in, at Lagrange points, would be favored by your community. And besides that, do no harm. Exactly. And I think um, we would also favor um, the ability to get detailed sample returns or chemical uh, evidence that we could relate to what we see from planets around other stars. Does anyone else have a short question? If not, I think we're, we're all set. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And